chapter 13, and uh, we're going to do the third series, third message in this, in this series. Um, 2 Kings chapter 14 talks about, or chapter 13 rather, um, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of give you a, a refresher on it just a little bit. King Jehoash has been the king now for a little while. We don't know exactly how long he's been the king. But he goes to the prophet Elisha because Elisha is old. The word says right there that he, is, he becomes ill with the sickness by which he is going to pass. And Jehoash is desperate. He has been under attack by the king of Aram. We'd also know it in some translations that's Syria. So he's been under attack and he needs a word from God. He needs some direction. He wants to uh, receive something from the man of God to know what to do uh, in, in this dire situation that he finds him in. And the king, and uh, rather the prophet Elisha, uh, gives him some simple instructions and the first instruction he gives him, he says, get a bow and an arrow, or get a bow and some arrows. And so I went ahead and I, I located my little trusty compound bow uh, uh, that was, belonged to Jeremy when he was just a kid. And uh, he said, take an arrow. And he said, the second thing he told him, he says, open up the east window. Well, there's the east and there's no window there, so we can't open it up. And I'm not uh, fool enough to try to shoot the arrow inside the church. Uh, I wouldn't know who I would hit. Hopefully I wouldn't hit anything. Uh, and, but there's got to hit something, you know, because it's all enclosed. But we're not going to shoot it uh, right now. But he said, open up the east window. And he said, take a shot. And so he took the shot and he says, the arrow of victory over Aram. And so what we have to understand is that sometimes the first message that we taught you this, with this series was that you've got to take aim at something, and you've got to take action. You've got to take aim at the battle, and you can't run from the battle necessarily, but you've got to take aim at the enemy and know that God has anointed you to overcome and has given you what you need to overcome. So we take aim and we take action. The second message that we, we looked at and, uh, was that there is a potential in each one of us. And so we looked at it and it's the dynamics of potential. Part of the message was that he says, take the rest of the arrows and strike the ground. And as he struck the ground, he struck the ground three times. And the, uh, the prophet was upset with him and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated the enemy. You see, the, you can't always see... Um, potential in individuals. We gave the illustration in 1962. There was a, a group of young men who went into a recording studio in England uh, by the name of Decca Records, and they played for an hour or something and played 15 songs to that uh, record label, and they were, sub they were systematically dismissed and said that you have no potential. We see no potential in your music. We don't see where you're going to make it in the music industry because guitar uh, groups are going out. And we know the rest of the story. The Beatles have sold an awful lot of albums since 1962. So you can't always see potential, but what you can see is patterns. You can see the patterns in individuals. We have to understand that potential has potential. It has the potential to make things something great and powerful, or it has the potential of being destructive and destroying. If, for example, if you know, you've heard the commercial that milk does a body good. But if you leave milk on the counter for a month or six months, it's not going to do you good. It's going to poison your system. So you have to know that the potential that we all have can be a great use to the kingdom of heaven and in your life. But if it goes unutilized, that potential becomes poisonous. And so we understand that there's some things that, that, that patterns and uh, demonstrate, create, and it, it, it gives us a vision of what potential is. This morning, I want to share with you a third message uh, uh, along this line, and it's called the value 
of provision. The value of provision. What we understand is simple from this passage of Scripture that uh, the, the prophet is telling him, the first thing he says, get the bow and some arrows. Notice the, pro- the, the, the king didn't have to go purchase a bow and some arrows. He didn't have to go hunt for some bows, a bow and some arrows. He didn't look up the, the interim, intricate details of what the bow and the arrow looked like. He wasn't looking for the Greek or the Hebrew or the Aramaic definition of bow and arrow. Sometimes we're looking for all the little intricate details that really don't help us. And re- really, they're, they're good, but they don't help us and they don't challenge us to live for God. They just simply help us cranial. And so he says, I want you to know that sometimes that the provision that you need is right there in your hand already. It's close by, and sometimes we have to locate that provision. And so the provision, what we need at this season, at this time in our life, God said, it's already close by. It's already in your life. It's already within your reach. Sometimes I've got to locate that that's really close by to me. There's a couple of stories in the Old Testament. First Kings chapter 17, there was uh, uh, the King, uh, the prophet Elijah, E L I J A H, uh, was instructed by God to go tell King Ahab that it was not going to rain again until he gave the command, and that if there's no rain, there's a famine that's about to take place. And so he goes and he tells that to King Ahab. Then the, the Lord tells Elijah, He says, Go to the brook Cherith. I have commanded ravens to, to feed you there. And so he went went to the brook Cherith. He went to the specific place the, the, that God instructed him to go. Had he gone to the brook Kidron or to the other brooks that were available in, in Israel, he would not have been fed. He would have, he would have died of starvation, but he was at the right place at the right time and God fed him. There's something there that you have to understand. God has a place for you to be fed spiritually. God has a place where you're going to be allow the minister, the pastor, the preacher to speak into your life. And when you allow that to take place, you be fed spiritually. But if you make a decision to go to this place because, well, I like the music or that place because I like this or this place because I like this other thing, then and it's not where God wants you to be. Listen, I'm preaching real good this morning. And it's not where you want, where God wants you to be, then you may enjoy all of the peripheral things, but you'll dry up spiritually. I'm preaching to the television audience as well as to you this morning. Amen. So now watch this. But when the brook dried up, because why? There's no rain. So what's Elijah to do? What's Elijah to do? And so God speaks to him. He says, I'm sending you to Sidon. I'm sending you to Zarephath. There is a widow there. I have commanded her to take care of you, to provide for you. Now, whoa, he didn't send them to the king. He didn't send them to a rich family. He didn't tell him, send them to a, the business people of the community. He sent him to the widow there in Sidon, in, in Zarephath. And he says, now you go. So he gets there and, uh, and the widow uh, is, is uh, out and she's out and about and she's uh, just doing her daily routine. And he says to her, would you provide, for, would you get me a little drink of water out of the well? She said, sure. Then he said, would you go ahead while you're doing that? Why don't you just make me a little cake? Now, he, she's not talking about a double fudge chocolate cake with all the trimmings. He's talking about just a little piece of bread. Right. Would you just fix me a piece of bread? She says, sir, all I got is a little bit of meal in my bin and a little bit of oil in the cruise. He said, she says, I'm fixing to go make a little piece of cake for my son and I. We're going to eat that and then we're going to die. There's nothing left. And so now guess what? He sent the prophet to her. She can't take care of herself. She is on her last meal, and he sent her, him to her to take care of him. He says, well, just do as you suppose, but make me a cake first. 
Because the Lord says that your, the, the, the bin of flour, the bin of meal will not be empty and the cruise of oil will not dry up as long as it hasn't rained. And so she goes and does it, and the word says that they ate off of that provision, and the, 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 the bin of, uh, of flour or meal never emptied, and the jar of oil never emptied, because she gave the little bit that she had, it was what was in her hand, her provision was right there, her provision for the future was right there for her and her son, was in in her possession at that moment, but she didn't know it. She took the provision and she did what God said to do with the provision. And as she did that, God blessed her and he supplied her need and the prophet's need uh, all because of her obedience. There's another story in first in second Kings chapter uh, four. There's a woman whose husband was a son, was a prophet who was in the school of the prophets. He was going to Bible college and uh, it cost him a lot of money to go to Bible college. And so he passes on and he leaves her in debt. And the, and the lady goes to Elisha and says, your, your son, my husband, has passed. Uh, speaking about her, his spiritual son, not his biological son. And he says, now I've only got a son and the creditors are coming to take my son and put him in prison or put him in slavery to pay for the debt. What am I going to do? And he said, what, he said, what do you want me to do for you? Uh, you can go ahead and read it. Second King, Second King chapter four. What do you want me to do? And he says, oh, tell me. What do you have in the house? Well, what do you mean in the house? What do you mean I have something in the house? Well, all I have in the house is a small jar of oil. Oh, well, he said, take what you have. He said, by the way, he says, go to all your neighbors, borrow some jugs and borrow some, uh, some containers and borrow things that you need from all of your neighbors. And he says, when you go in, shut yourself off and then start taking your jar and start putting some in these other jars. And he says, continue to do that and fill them all up. He said, don't borrow just a few, get a whole lot of them. And so when he had filled, she had filled the last one, she, she asked her son, bring me another jar. And uh, he said, well, there's none. So the, 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 the multiplication of the, the oil ceased. So he, she goes back to the prophet, says, well, I've got all these jars of oil. What am I supposed to do now? He said, simple, go sell them, pay off your debt and live on the rest. What am I saying? There are sometimes you've got to use what you've got in order to, uh, to, to, to fulfill and to do what God has called you to do. Sometimes your provision is not enough uh, to take care of everything that you need. But when you give it to God, He's not going to overlook the, the, the meager supply that you have. But when you give it to Him and trust in Him, He's going to multiply it. Glory to God. Now watch this. There's a third one in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 14. The, Jesus has got, uh, uh, he's, he's ministering and, and he's got his natural amphitheater. He's in the valley and there's people all over the mountainside and he's projecting and they're, they're getting hungry. They've been there for several hours and he tells his disciples, he said, feed the people. And, and they looked at him and said, Jesus, we don't have enough money to feed all these people. 200 days of 200 denarii or 200 days wages wouldn't be enough to feed all these people. He said, what do you got? He said, well, there's this little boy here. He's got a two-piece fish dinner from, from uh, uh, fish daddies. And, 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 and he says, well, he said, bring it here. So he blesses it. And I said, tell the people to sit down 50 out of 50 in a group. And he said, and then he blessed the food and he gave He started breaking them, giving it to his disciples. And you know the story. They picked up 12, 12 
baskets full of food. What am I saying? Sometimes we've got to take what we've got. We've got to take the shot. Elisha told the, the prophet, get the bow, get the arrow. That may be all you've got, but you've got to take the shot. You've got to do something with what you have. It's not just a matter of saying, I, I only have this or I only have that. You've got to take the shot. And I want you to see something, that it wasn't a lack of the weaponry. It wasn't the lack of the arrows that the, that the, that the, the king had. He had a hand full of arrows. It wasn't a lack of the equipment. It was a lack of his will. It was a lack of his determination. It was a lack of his effort. And you see, sometimes I believe that we have a lack because of the lack, not because of what God has already provided, not because of what's not, what's not already in our hand, but because of our lack of effort, our lack of determination. And so we realize that there is something that God has given me everything that I need in this season of my life. I want you to say that with me. God has given me everything that I need in this season of my life. Now watch this. God's provision doesn't always prevent the attack. It doesn't always prevent the battle. See, Jesus made the statement, in this world, you're going to have some traca. If you don't know French, that means you're going to have some trouble. You're going to have some tribulation. It's there. And but he says, but in the process of the troubles of life, God gives us the means. He gives us the wherewithal. He gives us the anointing. He gives us the supply. He gives us the provision to withstand, overcome, conquer, and have victory in every battle and every difficulty of our life. Now, I'm going to get a little serious here. See, many people come to God because they're like King Jehoash. They're in a desperate situation. They're desperate financially. They're desperate health-wise. They're desperate in their relationships. They're desperate for God to do something in their life. But so many and too many, when the desperation has been met, and the need has been met, and God moves and does some miraculous things, they suddenly or gradually begin to drift away. They drift out of church. They drift out of their relationship with God. They drift out of their commitment to God. It's almost as though consciously or unconsciously, inadvertently, they're asking God to create a life for them that he is not even needed. That's a sad thing. And yet we see it all the time. Point number two is that provision is connected to perspective how you see things. You see, as pastors, we get, often we will get different stories about the same event. People will say, as they're from their perspective, they will tell us this is what happened. And then we hear another side, and from their perspective, this is what happened. And so it's, it's a matter of perspective is how we see things. He said to the, to, to the king, the prophet said to the king, open up the east window. The window represents a perspective. It's what we see through. But do you know that not only what you look at, but what you look through affects what you see? It's interesting, isn't there? There's another passage in Malachi chapter 3 that talks about another window that God wants to open up for us. 
But the word says that if I give my tithes and I give offerings, that God is faithful and he will open up a window of heaven to pour out that blessing. The word says that blessing that is too great for me to contain. I like the way the Hebrew really says it'll be a blessing that will keep on giving and keep on be a blessing throughout your whole life. It'll be, it'll be more than what you need at that given moment. But watch this. We say, well, God is opening up the window, but the prerequisite to getting God to open up that window is that I do something. And that's pay my tithes and give offering. You can take a break, take a, take a deep breath. We're not taking up another offering. But see, it has to do with the lens that I'm looking at. My perspective will be uh, uh, in direct relationship to the lens that I'm looking to. I believe too many people look through the lens of limitation. The lens that says, I don't have enough. I can't do that. The lens tells you what you don't have, not what you do have. It's, it's what am I missing? What am I lacking? And so too often we look at len through lenses. Now, I'm looking through uh, some lenses right now, and, and you all are clear and, and beautiful, and I can see that all of your eyes are open. Right. But if I take these lenses off... I can still tell who you are, but I can't tell whether Janice has her eyes open or they're closed. Come on, I, can't, I, can't, I can't pick out a whole lot of detail. Now, uh, for some of you, you we, we did a message some time back about pink and blue, and, and sometimes you put on some glasses, uh -huh. Ooh, and Megan is blue. Not emotionally, she's just blue. She looks like the little Smurf girl. Uh, and, and so sometimes we, we see things from tinted glasses. We see things because of our past, because of where we've been, because perhaps uh, the, the upbringing that we had. We see things in a specific perspective and that will affect how we operate and how we live and sometimes you put on some of the some of the pink glasses and you just well you're really looking cool now pastor I, it's great because I can't see you at all with these things on because I need I need the the glasses that are progressive so we put these back on See which direction I need to preach in. <laughs> See, we need to ask God to give us lenses that I can see through the lenses of freedom, the lens of healing, the lens of forgiveness, the lens of victory, the lens that, uh, that, that, that God has for me right now. See, what I have is all I need right, right now. You see, right in the season that I'm in, God has what I need. But if I'm not seeing it through the right perspective, to the right glasses, I have a mentality of lack. Now, sometimes we, we see things and sometimes we experience things. We call it referred pain. We call it referred, uh, 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 that, that sometimes we see symptoms rather than causes. We see symptoms rather than the source. A number of years ago, I was doing some work at Luke's house. He had a whole bunch of bamboo in his backyard, and he just wanted them uh, gone, and we tried to cut them down, but they kept growing back. So the only way to get rid of the 
bamboo is you got to cut all the roots out, dig all the roots out. So I was back out there with my tractor and I was, I had the, I was kind of turning backwards because I had an auger on the back. I got a real old tractor. It's a 1984 model. If you want to give the church a 2017 model, that would be great. But anyway, we, we were digging this thing and, and all of a sudden, about a couple of days later, I started noticing some real strange sensations on the outside of the bottom of my legs. It, it, was, it was a little creepy crawly type of feeling. I felt like I had some bugs calling on my legs, on the outside of my legs all the time. I mean, I would sleep at night and I'd wake up in the middle of the night and this thing would just seem like, and it's like, I know there's no roaches in my bed, but it sure feels like something is crawling. And wasn't Pastor B, you know, uh, touching my, the bottom, my, my leg because she's sleeping uh, right next door. And, and, and so I just said, you know, so I started thinking, well, maybe I ought to take something because I got some leg issues. And so I'm, I'm smart enough to know that I need to, see that there's something that's causing that. So I went and started looking in my, in my I went to the, the uh, uh, computer and started looking on the computer, and it said that those, those nerves uh, that run along the outside of your leg on the, uh, uh, all the way from the knee down, and, and there's got a specific name for them. It's a peripheral arterial something, something or other, you know, this long dollar 75 word, and it says it's all connected to the sciatic nerve. Oh, I said, okay, well, that's the back. So I went to a chiropractor, and he did an x-ray and found I had three vertebrae that had shifted a quarter of an inch. Come on now. And so all he did was do some adjustments, got them back in place, the pain was gone. Now, you see, I could have taken all kind of medication for those, for those legs. I could have gone to the doctor, said, listen, I got these problems with the legs, and he'd have given me some muscle relaxers, he'd have given me some of this and some of that, and, and, and maybe that'll work, but it would not have gone to the source, would not have gone to the, to the, to the, to the, to the issue that was there. And so sometimes our, we, we look at our need, we look at what's out there, and God says, you got to look beneath the need. You got to look to another system. You got to look to a different place because what you're working on may only handle the symptoms, but until I get to see it personally, until I get to see it the way God wants me to see it, then I'm not going to get to the right source and not dif the, the, the right difficulty. See, so you got to realize that God sees my, see, I might be going through an issue today, but God sees my tomorrows and he knows what I need when I get there. And so he's always working to provide for me every day because he is Jehovah Jireh. Now watch this. God doesn't always prevent the battles of life. I'd like to tell you that when you give your heart to Jesus, you'd never have any more battles. I'd be lying. God doesn't always, God's provision doesn't always prevent the battles. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, there's a young man by the name of David. He is a shepherd and uh, he's bringing some uh, cheese and some bread to his brothers who are on the battle lines. And he goes and there's this giant of a man uh, that, that is standing up and he is being defiant to the king of Israel and defiant to the army of Israel. He's being defiant. He is, he is ridiculing. He is blaspheming. He is cursing them by his God and cursing the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and David says, why doesn't somebody do something? And they said, well, he's too big. David simply said, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. He's too big to miss. And so he goes to the king and he says, king, I'll take care of this uncircumcised Philistine. I've got a covenant with God. I'll take care of him. And the king says, no, you're just a boy. You can't, you can't fight him. 
And he said, listen, king, I've, I fought the lion when he was trying to get my, my daddy's sheep. I fought the bear when he was trying to get my daddy's flock. And he says, this circumcised Philistine, I will treat him like the lion. I'll treat him like the bear. Listen, there's some things that you've gone through in your life and some things that you maybe are going through right now. Don't, don't try to get out of the battle, but rely upon the anointing of God to help you go through the battle. Because the battle that you're facing today and the lion and the bear may only be a preparation and an equipping for the giant that you're going to face in the future. You see, God knows what you're going to face. God knows what you're going to go, go up against in the future. And he says, I'm going, to, I'm going to prepare them. I'm going to equip them to go through. Not just the battle that you're in today, but the battles that you're going to face later. And David, God knew David was eventually going to need a sword because he was fighting for his life. And so he destroyed the lion. He destroyed the bear. He destroyed Goliath and took his sword and he hid it. So that one day when David was on the run for his life, he remembered the sword of Goliath and he was able to go get the sword. God is Jehovah Jireh. He might be providing you right now with just a little bit. Seem like it's not enough. But if you'll use what you have, you take that shot, God will supply what you need. You see, it's a matter of perspective. You see, too often... is all I see the battle, is all that I see is the problem. Or can I, can I see the potential that's laced and enwrapped in this problem? You see, sometimes I only see what I'm missing, I only see what I'm not seeing. I'm only seeing what I don't have. And sometimes I got to start asking different questions. All right. Rather than, God, where are you? I need to start asking, God, what am I, what am I missing? What am I, what am I not seeing? What do I have in my life right now? What, I, what do I have right now that you have already provided for me? What is in my possession? What is so close at hand that all I need to do is utilize it? What provision are you making and you've given me at this point, at this season in my life because I am here and this is where I am? You see, sometimes God's provision comes in strange packages. Sometimes it comes in a bow and an arrow. Sometimes it comes in a little cruise of all. Sometimes it comes like a two fish piece dinner. A two piece fish dinner. I'll get it right. <laughs> it, it, sometimes it comes in small packages. It, we, don't under, we don't see it as God's provision but if we will take it I got to understand. You got to know that God will never leave you in a place where he will not provide for you. He'll not protect you and he will not feed you. He will always be there because he sees tomorrow before you get there and he's making provisions for you to get there. Now watch this. In the brook Cherith when Elisha was told to go to the brook Cherith. He said go over there to the brook Cherith. But if Elisha had gone to the brook Kidron on the other side of the country, the ravens are over there waiting for him and the stockpile is waiting for him all the time that he's drying up over here. I'm telling you that God has a place for you to be and the provision is going to be there because he is Jehovah Jireh. I got one more point. I've got a few more minutes with you. See, God sees the need beneath the need. You see, sometimes we see the need, but there's a need beneath the need. And God sees that. And I believe that he wants us to have the perspective so that we have the vision as part of the provision to see the need beneath the need. In Acts chapter 3, the apostle Peter and John were going to the temple 
at the hour of prayer. It says the night out, the ninth hour. They were going to pray. And there was a man there, it says that he was lame from his mother's womb. And he was there begging alms. And there was something that, you know, as they walked by, I'm sure he was saying alms for the blind or alms for the lame, something to that effect. And he got Peter's attention. And Peter said to him, look at us. The first thing Peter said, listen, I see you. Now, could it be that there were multitudes of people, praying people, good folks, who got to church before Peter? And perhaps many would have gotten to church after Peter. And they walk right by him, not seeing the need, much less the need beneath the need. You see, sometimes we need to be at the right place with the right people doing the right thing to have our need met. And this man at that day, and it's very possible that the apostles had walked by him on previous days. It's very possible that maybe even Jesus himself walked by him to pray. And somehow, this day, it was his day. Somehow, it was his time. Somehow, he was at the right place because God saw beneath the need. Listen, I want to encourage you those that are here, those that are watching by television, when the church is open and the man of God that you call your pastor is going to bring a message, do everything you can to be there. Because you don't know if that one Sunday, that one message will have an insert in it that's just for you. Not that pastor was was praying and, and and that he had a message just for you, but the Holy Ghost can take a section of a whole message and, and, and it zero in on what you need and see your need beneath the need and begin to speak to that so that when you leave, you simply say, man, the Holy Ghost spoke to me today. Why? Because I was in the right place at the right time. Peter fixed his eyes on him, and he says, I got good news for you. I see you. Because too many people walk right by him and didn't see him. I like to think that Peter saw a miracle that no one else saw. Peter saw the need beneath the need. God put something, some, some spectacles, some optometro, optometristic change in Peter at that moment so that he could see, here's a man, this is who you're sent to the hour of prayer for. Listen, God is an optometrist, and he wants to change your vision. He wants to change your eyesight so that when you walk by, you'll not just see a problem. You'll not just see a, a, a difficulty. You'll not just see a distraction. But what you see is God causing something to change on the inside of you because there's an, in, there's an anointing on you that God wants to minister to other people through you, through us as individuals. So say this with me, God, touch my eyes so that I can see. Lord, remove the lenses of limitation from my eyes. Lord, open the eyes of my heart. Now watch this, the man looked at them 
with an expectation. I, I'm sure others have, have just walked by, maybe threw him a little uh, pocket change, a little bit of uh, loose change that they had in his little cup. Uh, they just, uh, just honored him by, by doing that. And see, he was expecting a meal, but he got a miracle. He was expecting something from God, but his expectation was far below what God could do in his life and wanted to do in his life. Ephesians chapter 3 says, God is able to do more abundantly, more than we can ask or imagine according to the, 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 according to the power that is in us. Amen. Um, now watch this. Attention was all this guy had. That was his weapon. That was his provision. And when he paid attention, God opened that window. All right. Could it be that so many people are in need in their life not because of what they're not getting, because they're not opening the window by paying some attention to some of the things that are already in their life. They're not paying attention, so they're not opening up the window. They're not attending to the Word. They're not attending to the past. They're not attending to some things that they need to address in their life. They're not paying attention. So we got to realize that God supplies all my need, those that I can see and those that I cannot see. And then Peter took him by the hand and he said, stand up on your feet. See, sometimes we see the need, but God sees the need below the need. He was asking for some change, pocket change. God says, I'll do you one better. I'll change your life forever. I'll change your life. You see, sometimes we're asking God for some natural things because of the situation. Sometimes we're asking God, change my situation. Change this, 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 this situation that I'm in. And God says, I don't want to change this situation till I change you. I'll change you, and by changing you, the situation will change. Right. Whew, I don't know about you, but boy, this makes me feel good that God is more interested in me than in the situation that I'm in. God says that I want, to, I want you to help you to see beyond the surface and see below. Because see, God sees not only the natural physical needs, He sees the spiritual, emotional, relational needs that we have. And God says, I'll not only take care of those top needs that everybody sees, but I'll go deep into the recesses of your heart and make a lasting, profound, everlasting change on the inside of you so that you are not the same person. Listen, I, I heard this years ago. One touch from God, one word from God can change your life forever. I don't know about you, but I want that touch. I want that touch. I want that that God has for me. Could it be, and I, this is some food for your thought, that God wants to use you in the same way that he used Peter Come on. to be that instrument to touch a life forever. To be that instrument with the anointing. It's not you. It's not Peter. It was the anointing upon Peter. You, you understand that. Come on, that's sweet. But at the same time, I believe that God wants this church to be like Peter. He wants you and I to be like Peter. So I got to start asking God the questions, not just what am I lacking? What am I not seeing? that I already have, 
But as I go about my daily life, I need to ask him, what am I not seeing in the people around me, in, in the needs of the people around me? What am I not seeing? What is my life, why is my life so busy that I'm not seeing with somebody that I live next to or work next to or am having some recreation with? What are their needs that I'm not seeing? And you see, God said that he would open our eyes to help us to see just those things. I mean, I tell you, it is an exciting time to know that in the season that I am in, God has provided everything that I need. Everything I need in this season of my life, God already has. If it's not the, if it's not the complete thing that would meet your need, it will be the seed that you invest into the kingdom of heaven, invest in your life, invest in the life of others, and then you begin to see that little seed begin to multiply for what you need. So if you do nothing this morning, say, God, open the eyes of my heart. Correct my vision. Because you see, if it was all about you, then you got saved, God would take you home. But it's not always just about us. You become an instrument for God to use in your sphere. You become a tool. You become a connection between you and God and the people that you know that desperately need a touch from the Almighty. And so say this with me, Father, open my eyes. Help me to see what I'm not seeing. Help me to see the miracle that I've been passing by that I haven't paid attention to. Father, I, I thank you that at this season in my life, you have provided all that I need. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Glory to you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Glory, 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 glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Javante, during praise and worship, you, I, I looked over here and I saw the Lord putting something into your, into your, into your chest. And, and I said, Lord, what, what is that? He said, I'm, he said, that's a big man. But he said, he will, the heart I'm putting in him for others will dwarf his physical size. I, I don't know if that means anything to you, whether you look at other people and there's something that touches your heart, but if you'll receive it, God says he's going to give you the capacity to feel, to see, and not only that, but be able to be an encouragement to other people around you. That, that, that there's something, he's going to give you a platform. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know what, what all this entails. But I just see down on the inside of you a heart that's bigger than you. And God wants to do that in you if you'll receive it. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise your Father. Praise your Father. Now, I believe that was for Gervonta, but I tell you, when the Spirit of God moves in that fashion, any one of you can receive that same word for him. Amen.
that you can receive that same heart to be all that God wants you to be. Amen. Why don't you stand up with me if you would. <clears throat> Before we go, I know that it's getting late. I went a little bit longer than usual, but I'm just taking my time back. Hallelujah. Thank you again for pastor appreciation. I got to ask you before we go, there's some, some guests with us for the first time. If this is the, if, if, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, if this were your last day on planet earth and, 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 and we don't know, uh, God never promises us tomorrow. If this were your last day, where would you spend eternity. Would you spend eternity with God because he's opened up heaven to you uh, by have, uh, because you've accepted Jesus or you've, you've not necessarily rejected him, but you've not consciously received him uh, and you would spend your eternity without God, without the Father. And you don't know for sure. I'd like for you to lift your hand. I'd like to pray with you. If there's anybody here, you say, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to heaven or not. I'm, not. I'm really not sure. Listen, there is a heaven to gain. And there is a, a hell to shun and to turn away from. And if you're just not sure, I want you to raise your hand and I want to I pray for you. Anybody like that here? See that hand. Thank you, Father. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord Jesus.